I would like to uh, begin by welcoming everyone uh, to this public lecture. I would like to thank you for joining us. This public lecture given by Baynard Woods, which will center around his book, I Got a Monster, which focuses on the Gun Trace Task Force. Um, this lecture is sponsored by the Department of Humanities here at Coppin, as well as the philosophy program. Um, and my name is David Scott. I'm an associate professor and coordinator of the philosophy program. Uh, before I begin, I would like to thank Kelly Jackson and Robert Harper who are producing this event. And given the times in which we live, uh, we really do need help, many of us, including myself, with negotiating these technical aspects of, of this new reality. And so I wanna thank them very much for their help, their patience, um, and their competence. It's been fantastic. Um, Baynard Woods himself is an extraordinary writer, journalist. Um, he resides here in Baltimore. He's a Baltimorean. He's covered criminal justice, injustices, and protests for The Guardian and the Baltimore City newspaper. He's appeared in the New York Times. He's appeared in the Washington Post, Oxford American Magazine, other publications. Um, I first came across his work uh, in the Baltimore City paper, and I, I've always enjoyed reading it. His most recent work, as I mentioned at the top, uh, is a work written with Brandon Soderbergh called I Got a Monster, The Rise and Fall of America's Most Corrupt Police Squad. It's an extraordinary work um, which focuses on the notorious gun trace task force scandal, which broke in 2017, uh, really in the wake of the, of the Freddie Gray uprising. And, and it gives us a, a unique way and a new way to see uh, where that first uprising, that first event occurred. And it gives us a, a broader context in which to see it. Um, most intriguingly about Baynard is that he holds a doctorate in ancient philosophy, which I believe is really quite unique for an investigative journalist. I don't think I've heard of such a thing. And his take or his understanding of the relationship between uh, his investigative journalism and his uh, his scholarship, his work in ancient philosophy, uh, he describes his journalism as leading, as providing a way for him to lead a truly Socratic life, which I think is an incredibly intriguing understanding of the role both of philosophy and journalism today and how they might meet. And that will be a, a kind of primary focus of his lecture, of our discussion, and hopefully it will frame some of the questions you might have um, as we move along. Um, again, uh, on behalf of the Department of the Humanities and the Philosophy Program, I want to welcome all of you who have joined this lecture of Bernard Woods and the valuable conversation that I hope will follow this. Um, and of course, we at the uh, in the Department of Humanities, and uh, we would like to thank Baynard Woods uh, for his graciousness in allowing us to, you know, to invite him here and, and, and speak to us. And I, of course, I want to personally thank all the all of the participants, and that includes you who are logging in. Um, I want to thank you in advance. This is basically structured with, uh, after my introduction, as soon as I finish, uh, there'll be a uh, brief, I think, four minute uh, documentary video that uh, Baynard and Brandon put together, uh, sort of giving a context or giving a, a, a sense of what their book and their work is about. And then immediately after the documentary, Baynard will begin this lecture. Uh, and then once it, that's going to run 30 to 35 minutes and then once his lecture completes, um, then we'll have I'll come back and we'll have a, a conversation. Um, some of the questions that maybe we'll be able to frame um, whatever follows the Q&A. Um, and so with that, uh, I would like to uh, uh, present the documentary uh, video. Thank you.
seven police officers indicted on federal charges. The abuses of the Gun Trace Task Force are among the worst Baltimore City police corruption ever uncovered. It's hard to even find the word for the level of mayhem that they spread throughout the city. Hey, son! Hey, come downstairs right quick! When all this stuff with the Gun Trace Task Force was coming out, I thought they were just making these things up, and it was all true. They broke into houses, they stole drugs, they carried BB guns that they could plant on people they shot covering up meetings, searching without a warrant. These guys carried around a machete, grappling hooks, masks that look like a skeleton, all kinds of burglary equipment. It wasn't a fluke that all these cops ended up in the GTTF together and were getting away with what they were getting away with. Somebody was obviously watching out for them. It's the biggest not talked about secret that everyone knows. How all of this was missed, I don't know, but it's unacceptable. This is serious movie material here. This is better than Serpico. Cold blooded. That's who run this bitch. That shit don't stop. I don't care about that gun on the coast. You want to go somewhere talk to keep it hundred or not? Last chance. One of the ways they got away with it is they were robbing the voiceless. They targeted people who had records, people who were on probation, people they thought were drug dealers and they thought wouldn't make complaints. I was always looking over my shoulder, never knowing when this police going to do something to me again. Like they just was targeting people, whoever they can get money off of, or just playing stuff on people. They locked me up and took my money. I'm like, God dang, I could have kept the money and just let me go. I'm getting pulled over from not having a seatbelt on inside a gas station putting air in my tire. That don't make no sense at all. They copping up and it don't even be their charge. It, it, it don't be that. Yo and L had nobody fighting for them. To see all these people hit with all this bullshit. And then you find out that cops are stealing and dealing drugs. The violation of public trust that that in particular did was like unfathomable. It makes me bitter because it fucked my life up. Get it! Good man! Send them to the goddamn jail! The thing about this case is there's still so many unanswered questions. Who's questioning the gun arrest? Where did we mess up? You know, did we have strong enough checks and balances? The state's attorney's office knows exactly what's going on, and they do what? They just look the other way. But I pledge to not to help build public trust in law enforcement. The answers are not far away. It's just making the people that actually run and operate in the city fucking pay attention. Thousands of cases are tainted by the convicted gun trace task force officers. So we will ultimately not rest until we challenge all of them. And everything done in the dark comes to the light. It's just unfortunate that we went through what we went through and we had to suffer the hardships. We don't begin to be honest and truthful with the citizens of the city. It's going to get worse before it gets that. That's what happens when you give people a certain amount of power. They will do it, and they will enrich their soul. I know there's good, hardworking officers, men and women on the Baltimore City Police Force, but until they can change the culture, none of them get the benefit of the doubt. Let's talk about the corruption on top. It's all lies. Heads should roll at all levels. I can't say I got some hope for you. I just can begin to rebuild my life. We never want to have the gun trace task force ever again. It is our duty to fight for our freedom. We have nothing to lose but our chains. All right, hey everybody. Uh, thanks so much to uh, Professor Scott for having me. I wish we could. Uh, as for everything, be in person. I miss teaching quite a bit. Uh, I, I used to teach, and part of what I'm going to talk about a little bit is going from uh, an academic setting to being a reporter and how that played out in the course of, of this book. And I'll talk about the case in the book as well because it's it's much more interesting than my life. But the way that I'm I'm thinking about all of this is about questions. What are the questions we asked? What kind of questions should have been asked that would have made cases like this not happen? What kind of questions do we in universities and in the academy learn to ask? What kind of questions do reporters ask? And what could we all do to ask better questions? So the the sort of working title here is, is how to ask a question uh, or something along those lines. Um, everybody in this book is functions, their career functions on questions to give a little bit of background so it, it follows the gun trace task force case uh, as you saw in the the book trailer that we just watched but one of the things that we wanted to do it, it's written a lot like a thriller um 
it's the biggest compliment has been that people have really raced through it quickly rather than than reading it you know really having to to struggle through it and we wanted to do that on purpose and we wanted it to be a thriller but so often thrillers are right wing and and frankly fascist uh and racist and sneak in all of these ideas about police that encourage this kind of behavior all of these cops grew up watching the same cop shows we all did where they break the laws to get the job done and they're the the good cop and uh, so we had to find out since the cops were the robbers, were the bad guys, normally a book like this is structured as a cat and mouse sort of game. So what we had to do was find out who's going to be the investigator. Uh, the cops are robbing all kinds of people, but primarily people they thought were drug dealers. Uh, and so then the lawyers of those people were the ones who knew what was happening. And uh, we'll talk about some more. One of the reasons that that didn't come out is it's not a defense attorney's job to say, you know, Your Honor, uh, my client actually had 10 kilos of cocaine, not the eight kilos that they charged him with. Uh, what they're trying to do is get their client off. So how do we find out, how do we break through the veil of invisibility that allowed this to go on? And the answer to that is by asking questions, but there's a lot of different uh, sorts of questions that we could could ask. And so, uh, you know, as as Professor Scott mentioned, uh, I studied ancient Greek philosophy. Uh, when I finished a PhD, I didn't think that was what I wanted to do for a job is be a professor. And I taught high school for a while in DC, but I, I'd always been writing and reporting, but I was looking for a way. I wrote my dissertation about Socrates, um, you know, who was famous for asking questions. And I, I thought that the kind of life he lived was what interested me about philosophy in the first place. And that wasn't the life that I saw for myself uh, being a professor. It was also, you know, that sounds, that's the fancy version. Also, my wife uh, was also finishing a PhD and we weren't going to get jobs in the same town and stuff. And you got to think economically as well. And so, uh, but, you know, I, I thought Socrates, he was executed in 399 BC for going out and asking questions on the street. And I thought that that scared philosophy a little bit. It made Plato and then most of the people with a few exceptions subsequent to him, it sent them inside, uh, sent them in the, the academy. It's the creation of the academy. Uh, was Plato founded it after the death of Socrates. And I wanted something maybe a little more, uh, you know, outside than that and a little more public than that. And I realized that being a reporter was the only way to really live a truly Socratic life, to ask the kinds of questions that piss people off, that people don't want to be asked, that people don't want to hear you ask um, in a way that matters. And so I started trying to freelance and I was, I was really lucky enough at that time, there were alternative weeklies, not only here, but all around the country. Um, and they've just, they've been dying. And there are a lot of other publications. We have about, 25% of the number of people reporting on the city right now, as we did a decade ago when I started reporting here. And that's going to be, that's important as well, because that's what allows corruption to happen. You may have noticed Mayor Pugh in that video, uh, who's, you know, was just recently sentenced to federal prison as well. When we were interviewing her, uh, she had not been charged for the Healthy Holly scandal. And I was asking questions that brought that about, but there's just so many fewer of us tasks. So I started working uh, at the Baltimore City Paper. And I took over from someone else who was going on maternity leave and I was an arts editor. And that was mainly the kind of stuff I was writing about. You you had to write about everything in a paper like that. We had such a small staff. You may remember we they were get out at bus stops, at restaurants, at coffee shops, at universities. They were free on the street. And you know it was vitally important because it was a way that people could engage in conversation with the city and back with us um, without having to be online. And the city still has a huge number of people that uh, aren't online in a regular way, which makes things like this all the more unfortunate. Um, and it makes things like a print paper that could be free uh, all that much more important. And so I was covering every kind of art thing there was and got wind of a story. Um, this was in 2014 that there, there's a rapper, Young Moose, um, and he had just been arrested by a detective, Daniel Hersel. And when we started looking into it, the writer D. Watkins sort of brought the story to us. And when we started looking into it, the, the person who's my co-author now in this book, Brandon Soderbergh, uh, we started looking at that. And 
it was crazy that they were using uh, Moose's rap video specifically for a song posted. If you if you want to go watch what the video is, uh, used it as probable cause to get a warrant to raid his house. So you know, every time a cop gets a warrant, they have to present in, in an affidavit, present the evidence that they have to take to a judge, and a judge will sign off on that. This is where another place questions should be asked. The judges should be asking about this. The judges didn't ask the kind of questions that they should be asking because they gave a search warrant for a home uh, that, that wasn't registered, that wasn't the home of this individual, of uh, Kevron Evans, who, who wrapped under the name Young Moose. Um, and the videos were an artistic project and his lyrics were an artistic project. And so, you know, we thought they're not raiding David Simon's house. Uh, and, and because he shows it has a video in which people have guns and stuff in them. So there's, there's guns in this video. How do they know those guns are real? When was this video filmed? All of the questions that should be asked by a judge to give that kind of warrant uh, weren't asked. They raided the house. They arrested the entire family, not only Moose, but his dad, his two brothers, his mom showed up to see what was going on, arrested her. So I started following this case and started asking the defense lawyer a lot of questions and started getting into it that way. It turned out that um, he was able to get bail and get out, um, but the, the detective Daniel Herschel didn't want him to, uh, to perform. He had a, a it's now, I guess, the Royal Farms Arena, but he had a, a performance coming up with uh, Boozy at, in, in that year, 2014, was going to be the big sort of break. I mean, if you if you remember, if anyone remembers, like everyone in the city was listening to Moose at that time. Uh, he wasn't getting necessarily a lot of press. He wasn't necessarily popular in a lot of other kind of, you know, music magazines and stuff. But every car that drove by, everywhere you went, that's what was... Uh, that's what was playing. And this was the moment that he was going to really be able to sort of break out at a bigger level by opening up for someone who who was huge, you know, and, and especially here that people just really admired. Um, Herschel knew this and did not want Moose to be able to perform there. The context is Moose was rapping about uh, Herschel in a number of his, his uh, songs. And so it, it was like, it almost seemed like a rap beef where this cop was was pissed off at what he was saying about him. So he was going to exact revenge in the way that he could. Um, so he went to a probation officer from a previous arrest and went to him and showed him the vid a video that was posted a year before he was ever on probation and presented it as if it was a surveillance video. The guy violated his probation. He was put back in. He missed the show. Uh, this went on for a year and a half of various court cases and trials and stuff, or a year, I guess, until all charges were ultimately dismissed. There was the, and it turned out, uh, you know, but but his career had been entirely, he couldn't tour during that period. He couldn't play anywhere out, couldn't be around alcohol, all of these uh, things that were part of, of his release. So it still really hurt his career, even though it was, was false charges that there really weren't evidence for. for. So this was uh, late 2014, early 2015. Uh, Freddie Gray is killed by police in Gilmore Homes in West Baltimore. Moose was in East Baltimore. Um, and we just gave up everything else we were doing for the paper to cover those events. And we thought we were able to do it better than The Sun was doing because we asked different kinds of questions. And the same thing, The Sun was covering the Moose story um, but they tend to, the way that daily papers and other more institutionally uh, based print products and, and magazines and stuff rely on documents. And so you'll see all the stories, police say, police say this person did that, police say, and, and they're single source stories. The number one rule of journalism is you're supposed to have multiple sources to back things up. The only two kinds of stories that, that don't have that uh, are police stories where because you have a document, you're not going to get sued over it. And because you, like the police so often as a reporter, think so poorly of the people that are arrested. Oh, well, he had he had a gun. That not worth me worrying about. Not going to ask him what really happened. Um, we were able to cover the Moose story a lot better and, and figure out what was going on with this Herschel guy. They then trusted us and were sending videos of that they had busted into the their store, the out the mud store, 
and busted open the safe and stolen the money out of it. Um, so you, you develop different kinds of sources if you ask different kinds of questions because you develop different relationships with people. Questions create community. So by the time, oh, and I guess in late 2014, the other uh, between those is massive protests broke out. And some sometimes people forget that. But the Baltimore uprising really began the day before Thanksgiving in 2014 when uh, Officer Darren Wilson wasn't. Uh, indicted for when the grand jury in Ferguson came back and didn't indict the officer that shot Mike Brown. There started being just massive thousands of people in the street here. And they shut down the lighting of the monument, made the mayor flee from that um, at that point. So it was really an intense um, period of protests. And we were out constantly on the street then. So when, after the police killed Freddie Gray at City Paper, we were, we were prepared for that story in many ways. Um, in many ways, we weren't, you know, many, we had a lot of flaws as well. We were a largely white paper in a largely black city. Um, and we had a lot of black freelancers, but they weren't necessarily making editorial decisions. And this is, I'll come back to this because it, it uh, is something that I've learned a lot more about subsequently about the way that the logic of white people in a city like this is really similar to the logic of police um, that, that we think we shouldn't be bound by the law, but we should be protected by it. We tend to think that other people should be bound by it, but not protected by it. And you see that with the, the you know, Karen videos with Amy Cooper and stuff. She's the one breaking the law and she's saying she's going to call the police. Uh, and it's the same thing you see with the Baltimore Police Department. If we can't break rules, then, oh my gosh, murders are just gonna go crazy and everybody's gonna die. You have to let us do whatever we wanna do. Um, but, you know, before that, I'd had no clue about covering police. I'd, I'd, uh, but I'd been arrested a number of times when I was in high school. I grew up in South Carolina and kept getting arrested for smoking weed. Uh, this was in the 80s and the Bush war on drugs. I had long hair and, and you know, they, they would uh, pull me over and, and I was sort of a collateral damage in the drug war. Uh, not the primary target, but but was getting swept up anyway. And, and I knew they would lie. And then so I, I came with a certain skepticism that reporters, one of the police reporters at The Sun and I have talked about it a lot. He grew up with no bad interactions with police and only trusted them. So when he was coming in this, um, as he was coming to the stories, he was tending to believe the police. We were tending to believe people on the street. And this gives you an entirely different uh outlook and view on what people will tell you and what you can see and on the way the world appears. And this is, I mean, this is one of the fundamental themes of, of philosophy that asking questions makes the world appear. And it's what we do as reporters and it's what we do as philosophers. It's what we do as citizens as well. And it's what police do. They ask fundamentally different questions in you know a city like this that's so hyper segregated they function in an entirely different way and ask entirely different questions depending on the kind of neighborhood that they're operating in if they're in a black neighborhood then you see the kinds of cops like the gun trace task force jump out boys knockers um you know and you see patrol in white neighborhoods they shortly around that time, the No Boundaries Coalition put out a, a big survey from West Baltimore that that uh, used the great phrase over policed yet underserved. And I saw that really clearly, you know, for the first time, I think around that period of spending a lot of time watching police in black neighborhoods rather than, you know, in Mount Vernon, uh, Seton Hill, where where I live. And it was an entirely different function. I'd never seen police in Mount Vernon just pull up on people, make them sit down, strip search them, as was happening every day in West Baltimore. And the kinds of questions they ask are fundamentally different. Are you all right? Or where are the drugs? Um, these stories went unnoticed by people who it wasn't happening to because of the questions we asked. The questions we asked limited the world that appeared to us, you know, over the, the 90s and up until about this time, uh, it was primarily the drug war that allowed 
the zero tolerance, uh, stop and frisk, uh, just fascistic uh, kind of policing to happen. And white people especially overlooked it. Um, but also, you know, wealthier black people and stuff overlooked it because it wasn't happening to us. And because at that point, drugs being demonized like that, even if I'm like <sighs> cocaine, I'm like, well, I don't smoke crack. That's those people. And so I'm not going to question that arrest. Um, now, as, as we feel less comfortable with that kind of policing going on over drugs, as, as society as a whole has moved left on the question of drugs, police still do exactly the same thing. They just justify it to us through guns. This is where the Gun Trace Task Force will end up coming in. It was created to be this situation where they were going to just trace the guns back and work them like a big, uh, like a big drug case where you get the, you know, you get a, a street dealer, you work it back, work it back, work it back, all the way to the, you know, you finally find the person with the raw dope, and you make a big uh, bust. They were they were looking to do stuff like that and to move away from the lock everyone up to a more targeted enforcement, as, as our commissioners always love to say, going after bad guys on bad guys with guns. Um, and so during after that uprising, this became the dominant uh, question that allowed and this is where the book starts. So the book starts with uh, the, the line that Baltimore almost had a revolution and the uprising and it sort of walks through that as a moment of, of revolutionary potential in the city. But then it strictly begins in March of 2016 with these co specific cops acting as a counterinsurgency um, because what happened in the period between 2015 and 2016? Um, murder, the homicide rate skyrocketed. We started seeing murders increase greatly. Um, and as people looked for reasons for that, Police want to take credit for always for lowering crime. The, the secret they never say is crime is great for police. And so uh, because they get more money, they get more overtime, they get more leeway. So as the homicide rate was going up, people are like, why is this happening? Everyone from James Comey, who was head of the FBI at the time, down to local commissioners in Ferguson and here, said, well, there's a police slowdown. It's the Ferguson effect. These cops are afraid of getting called on viral video. They don't they don't want to get prosecuted by Marilyn Mosby. They don't want all of these reasons of why police weren't policing. And that's what made it, the crime rate go up. Of course, that presupposes that police stop crime, which is a, the, a, the question that reporters almost never ask. Do police really stop crime? And I think the answer actually that this book shows is that no, the kind of policing, the plainclothes policing, uh, actually increases crime. It's so the sociologists would call criminogenic. It causes crime because they are fundamentally on a war footing with the city that they're supposed to be policing. If we take their language literally, if we ask questions, why did you start in 2016 a war room, what you're calling a war room? Why do you call it the war on drugs? Why do you call it the war on guns? Because you're actually waging war on your population and it is largely a racist war. Every now and then there will be uh, white people caught up as collateral, but it's it's largely a, a racist war. And the police officers, the black police officers who are waging that war will then assume the logic of whiteness of being protected, but not bound by the law um, and expect everyone else to be bound and not protected. Um, so, this was something people weren't noticing because they were buying into that logic that, hey, it must be the cops are slowing down. And there were some cops that were slowing down. It was taking longer if you called 911 to get someone to your house. Uh, it was taking longer if, uh, you know, they, they weren't doing the service kinds of call. And homicide, you know, the, the clearance rate, as the homicide drugs, the clearance rate, the number of arrests they made in homicides went drastically down. You know, so if, if someone kills someone close to you, and you know there's a two-thirds chance they're not going to catch that person. There's a likelihood that they're going to come after you, maybe two. And if you take revenge, that there's going to be a two-thirds chance they're not going to catch you. That causes the crime to rise even more. What it turned out uh, in March of 2017, when these officers were indicted, this veil was lifted up over what was actually going on in that time period. And it showed us exactly how 
the police were increasing this crime. Uh, while that slowdown was going on, the knockers, the jump out boys, the GTTF, and GTTF has become this country's task force. It's almost like BGF, like this, you know, gang initials that that's used to scare people. Um, and used to separate it from the more important initials, BPB, because these these squads change names every time they're in trouble. S Visid, Visis, SES, SET, same guys doing the same stuff. Uh, we now know going back to at least documentedly, you know, in the federal cases to 2009, but uh, probably much earlier. So we, we see what they're doing. Uh, while there was this story of a slowdown, while Commissioner Batts gets fired uh, because of the homicide rate rising, Commissioner Davis comes in, white guy from PG County, by the way, who had been himself accused of kidnapping someone previously uh, and harassing them. He tells these plainclothes guys, do what you need to do to get the job done. This is the thing that uh, we need to just get these numbers down. And they were driven by statistics. So Wayne Jenkins, the head of the GTTF, he was in this perfect position because he wasn't slowing down. He wasn't taking a knee. He was getting a gun a night. Uh, and this made everyone love him. This did, they gave him opened up overtime. Uh, he, he had gotten a bronze star right around this time for rescuing cops from the, the standoff of students outside of Mondawmin, um, commandeering a van to rescue him. But what we didn't know is later that night, he stole a bunch of the drugs that were uh, supposed to be you know, the, the cause of the murder rate, he stole those drugs, took them to a bail bondsman who sold drugs for him in the county, uh, and they sold those drugs back in the county. But he was doing this every night. He would do something called a door pop. Anytime there's a group of black men standing around, they would speed up in a car, slam on the brakes, pop the door open. If anyone ran, they would chase them, tackle them, or sometimes throw a radio at their head. They called that radio head. But take the person down, if they had a gun, they'd arrest them and take the gun. If they had drugs, they'd let them go and they'd take the drugs and they'd go sell them. They also started uh, just robbing, like not only the street rips like that, robbing people on the street, but using all of the war room federal uh, information that they were using for investigations to go get the major dealers, people who were living in more uh, leafy type neighborhoods. And so the book starts with a case where they stop a guy um, as some sitting in a minivan, as someone else gets in his van in, in March of 2016, they find cocaine in the van, illegally search the van, find cocaine, find money, go back to his house, uh, steal over $100,000 from the safe, close the safe back and video it, um, themselves opening the safe. Then they go get a, they, they go get a warrant after they've already robbed him and then come into the house they use all kinds of other videos to fake this. They try, they make a fake note to try to break up the guy's marriage so that the wife won't pay for a lawyer. There, there's so many levels of chances we could have caught them, but no one was asking the right questions of them. The judges that they went to weren't asking the right questions. When they got, when we finally got body cameras in the city in the summer of 2016, they captured themselves. They were targeting safe streets workers we can talk a little bit about this in the question and answer part. I know some of the students read a story that we wrote for The Intercept about that, about the idea of violence interruption and some alternatives to policing. Um, but they were targeting people that were trying to stop the violence. And they were uh, then they filmed themselves accidentally on their own body camera footage going into his house. When the defense attorney says, you, you have it on your own footage. They're breaking into my client's house. The judge didn't care. The prosecutor didn't care. So as we go up the line again and again and again, we see the people who should be asking questions aren't asking questions, and that makes the world, or aren't asking the right questions, and that makes the world appear differently to them. And that's that's true of us as reporters, um, and it's true of law enforcement officers. It's true of of lawyers, judges, of philosophers, and so honing the kinds of questions that we ask is the way that we can best um, find ourselves living ethically and functioning in, in a way where we can see the world, where the world appears to us uh, most clearly. And you really had to do that with people like these cops who were, I mean, they were even double and triple crossing 
each other. Um, but they were a master at different kinds of at deflecting questions, but also at asking different questions. So one of the things they would always ask, they were looking for new people to rob. So they would say, instead of, you know, for stop snitching and stuff, instead of saying like, oh, who's, who's your plug? They would say, uh, who would you, if you had a crew, who would you rob? And that way, and that's what they literally wanted to do. But that way they also were sort of, we're not asking you to snitch. We're not going to go arrest this person. We're going to go rob this person. Um, so, you know, to come back to, in concluding, to come back to the a little bit about philosophy, you know, in, in Plato's Republic, he talked about this idea of a ring of invisibility. If you've ever also read or seen Lord of the Rings, they take that up there with the that ring there. But in Plato, it's the myth of Gyges, and it's it's really talking about power. Though it's an it's an analogy of power, and it says anyone who has the the ring of invisibility ultimately is going to become corrupt, and ultimately will kill the king and take over. What we have done in this city in particular, but in America as a whole, is we have given police officers a ring of invisibility. We keep their internal affairs records secret. We keep their disciplinary records secret. Everything about what happens is shielded from us. We don't see it. No one. They try to shield it from the defense attorneys so that no one can hold them accountable. Um, and that puts us all in a position of seeing the world as the state, as authority, presents it to us in a way that can steal people's freedom. So going back to uh, you know the case of, of the, the book starts with the guy who they steal these, these kilos from, uh, they arrest him. He's in jail from March 1st, 2016 through October 31st, 2016, denied bail uh, in, in the bail hearings um, while his drugs were given to a bail bondsman to sell, you know. <laughs> But but we trust the bail bondsman, and he's denied bail. He's locked up all this amount of time, and and people who haven't been locked up think, oh well, you know, justice was served. He got off and stuff. But seven months uh, incarcerated that destroys people's lives in in just vast ways. Um, and so every time they make up a lie, even if that becomes right later, that destroys huge numbers of lives. You know, in one case, they stole a bunch of drugs from a guy that people have just been indicted for this, uh, a 2009 case, and they lied to him and told him that his girlfriend was the one who had informed on him just to uh, endanger her life and, and destroy their relationship and make things worse for him uh, so that they would less be able to say that someone stole. And so what kind of arsenal of questions um, can we develop that allows us to second guess what people in power tell us that allows us to second guess the narratives that go across one case, uh, the case of Keith Davis Jr. We, the last thing I mentioned before we open it up for the conversation, I think is, uh, you know, I was, I left City Paper and I started covering criminal justice for The Guardian, a British newspaper that goes around the world. Um, and a guy, this was June, Father's Day of 2015, right after the charges had been brought against the Freddie Gray police officers. And he was shot at 43 times by Baltimore police officers. They said he had robbed a hack who crashed his car into the police car. They chased him down an alley, cornered him in a garage. Um, no other reporters were asking questions about the narrative that the police gave because it was, oh, he had a gun. He was shooting at them. Turned out the gun was never fired. He didn't shoot at them at all. Um, it turned out there were huge numbers of, of problems with that story. Turned out that first cop who showed up and shot was being investigated by the federal government for uh, running guns for drug dealers and giving cover for drug dealers. And so, um, but I remember talking to a reporter who said, uh, oh, why are you doing that story? They already, you know, he had a gun. They already had, a, we already know what happened. And it's because the first story goes out in the paper, this person was shot, police say this, you get no other side. And then when it's forgotten, all you remember, you forget the police say, and you're just like, that's what happened. Uh, so the kind of critical reading, the kind of critical thinking, the kind of critical um, engagement with the world that programs like the humanities are providing us allows us to, there's a great uh, 
thing that my wife always quotes from Toni Morrison that I'm going to uh, steal right now, that the project of the humanities is defending our own uh, remaining human and defending the humanity of others. And I think that also should be the project of reporting. And as we look at this, this presidential race, as we look at what's happening in city after city around the country right now where they had uprisings, and we're seeing the same narrative of crime rising, it's because we have to question that because that's the thing that we as the media are putting out. And that it's predominantly white reporters putting out these stories about what police using the logic of whiteness are doing predominantly to black communities um, is, is a huge problem. And so what we all need to do as reporters is ask more questions. And that's, that's really what led us to this book was covering this story. And like, there's so much more that we need to know and so many more sides. Uh, you know, the way they got away with it at all is they thought that the people they robbed were beneath the law. And they also thought they were beneath journalists. We wanted to listen to those people's stories. Uh, we did a documentary, that little clip was uh, just a book trailer, but we filmed a documentary simultaneously that even more than the book focuses on the stories of the victims of the Gun Trace Task Force. And some of them we can't talk about because, uh, you know, one guy, they stole $10,000 from him. His name was Davon Robinson. He then had a debt. People thought that he couldn't pay. People followed him from court and murdered him. Um, so, but the people that we did get to talk to in many ways are the Freddie Grays and the, the George Floyds who lived. And these stories, their stories uh, as up against these police stories and that their lives are valuable is important. And so that's that's why we did this. And that's that's the project that I think we're all in together as reporters, professors, students, question askers uh, in the humanities and in, in you know, defense lawyers and in, in the law. So now uh, I know that, that Professor Scott has some questions and hope to hear some questions from uh, the audience through the, the question uh, function on here. Unfortunately, we I, I don't think I'll be able to hear your voices because the human voice is so important here. Uh, but please ask any kind of question that you have. All right, Professor Scott. Uh, unmute yourself, David. Okay, how's that? Great, great, uh, perfect. Technology. So uh, thank you again, man, for your presentation. Um, the, the the work is extraordinary. And, and uh, you know, let me, I, I see that there's a question up there and, and I'll, I'll try to back into it a little bit. But I think what I want to do is start out trying to, maybe we can have a conversation about this try to frame some of these questions um, and and start by doing so, um, hopefully then sort of open up some other questions. And also just sort of begin where you, where you began and what's, what was sort of the primary thrust of your of your uh, talk, which is this, this issue of questions, of asking questions and, and the intersection with, uh, you know, having studied ancient philosophy and and approaching journalism as a philosopher there's a there's a long tradition of that not tradition but but there have been philosophers who have sort of spoken about that and the two things that pop out and actually uh someone has somebody already commented about it, the two quotes that you put forward was questions create community which is a profoundly philosophical statement and also asking questions make the world makes the world appear and and that's those are powerful things and and you and you describe being a journalist as as your attempt to try to you know live the Socratic life and I mean pardon me for being a nerd for a second and being what I am an academic the first thing that popped into my head was that that distinction really that comes out ancient stoicism between philosophical discourse and philosophy itself so philosophical discourse is what you know, you you study you study philosophy like you study biology, like you study, you know, science or, or computer science or whatever, right? It's 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 these books, it's this body of knowledge that you memorize a bunch of stuff and it has is broken down into forms of knowledge and then you you have it. And so supposedly you have knowledge. But philosophy itself, at least in the way the Greeks understood, was existential. It was literally a way to live a life. And how you live that life 
as, as you clarified, is by asking questions. And there's this, this term that popped into my head, parousia, right? Free, uh, free speech, right? Um, talking freely. And to do so is to speak the truth. And to speak the truth is to speak, anytime we speak truth is you, you risk, you prefer the risk. It's a risk in speaking the truth. And as a journalist, that's where you can see, so at least when I read your work and I, and I was listening to you speaking, it's, it's where it's where you see a connection between, you know, how you understand your investigative journalism and philosophy. It's a risky, it's a risky thing to to speak the truth, especially when we know. And as you clarify in your work and in your talk, very few people, you know, are willing to speak the truth, particularly in the times in which we find ourselves. And one of the things that we have to try to speak our truth about is a question that a uh, philosopher, and, and I, I, we talked about this briefly a couple of days ago, philosopher Michel Foucault, he puts forward a philosophical question, who are we at present? Who are we at present? And I think that's an important question. He didn't say, who am I at present? But the question that we have to ask is, who are we? You and I, the community in which we exist, the society in which we exist, and the risk is, asking a question that forces us to think about how where we are today is not where we were yesterday, not about some utopian future. And so I'm basically what I'm trying to do is frame the question I'm going to put forward to you and, and see if we can go from there, which is in your work, what you have done, have you have you asked the question that you feel like uh, either in itself or contributes to a difference um, in in and maybe how we think about policing, maybe in how we can approach policing, or is it just a matter of shining a light on it and then opening up a space that now we we see what's there? The invisibility, as you said, is gone, right? You've taken that off, and no, now we see how the state operates to protect itself and hide these things. Or or is what's the next step? What's the next question? You think? that could follow from the questions that you already presented? Yeah, that's a great question. And I'll add, I see the one in the, the Q&A thing too about uh, defunding and stuff. And so I think I can maybe put, uh, yeah. put that into uh, this question as well, because I think one of the things that we, me and my co-author Brandon, do differently than most reporters and what made this book differently is we didn't look at police and it wasn't just shining light on what police are doing. They're, they're uh, you know, the, with the Sun's reporting on this, just shine the light. Here's the corruption. How did it happen? Um, what we saw, one thing that, that my classical training did is I noticed that this was basically the Iliad, right? Like when you get rid of our, our preconceptions about what police are and what were they're supposed to be, what we have is a band of pirates running around in a, a chariot trying to get into the palaces of people they think don't deserve the money they have and steal it for glory and money. Um, that's, and and then you we started also looking that like, you know, so many people have told me that police here don't function like police, but function like an occupying army. A uh, former one of these jump out guys said, I, there was a night, 4th of July, when I'm hassling a guy for drinking out of a brown paper bag that I realized I was part of an occupying army and I had to quit. So we actually looked at, we took their language literally, the war on drugs, the war on guns, the war room, and we actually looked at them as this historical force. Uh, one of the things that we've learned that we think needs to be really out there right now in uh, this presidential election and discourse is that police are a special interest of their own. Yeah. They are out what's good for themselves. We tend to think they're there to make us be safe, but they're not. Crime is good for them. Crime increases. Every time there's lower crime, uh, it's bad for cops. So, so to put that in concrete numbers, um, over the last five years, 1,500 people have been murdered in this city, almost all young black men. The police department has had $500 million a year for every one of those years in its budget. And it's gone up a little bit every year. It's around 500, but it gets, for the, the more abysmal the failure, the more money they get. So when people call to defund the police, uh, you know, you see Trump encouraging death squads and stuff, and, and you see uh, 
Biden saying, no, what we need is more money for police, more money for police. One of the things that this really showed us, reporting this story showed us how all of that discourse was broken um, because every bit of the Obama era police reforms, consent decrees, uh, body cameras, they, they turned all of these things that we thought were going to help reform policing to their own ends and used it to thwart reform. And we have a, a, a piece arguing for that in the Washington Post, if anyone wants to uh, anyone wants to look at it, uh, if you just if you search us in the post, it comes up. But it, it really shows step by step how they functioned as a counterinsurgency to destroy the momentum that had been built, the revolutionary momentum that had been built uh, after the death of Freddie Gray. And that's important because it's an entirely different framework. If you think of seeing it in that framework where police are this entity that whose purpose is to serve themselves, and you see the protest as this revolutionary movement, then you see more clearly what's happening and what the police are doing. And, and then to go back historically a little bit, you start to look, uh, you know, the very badges that they used were the slave patrol badges created, you know, by my ancestors in Charleston uh, several centuries ago in South Carolina. The, the, the word beat for police comes from they had slave patrols and there were five different beats that they would go on and and you know and that unfortunately that comes to us as is in the reporting profession as well that's my beat and that comes from that um so when we accept the premises as as things like daily papers do that the police and the institutions and daily papers being an institution put out we're gonna report it in a certain way and just uncover that light so what we were trying to do is break people out of that entire premise of what policing is and what its purpose is. Um, you know, people say the policing system's broken and, and abolitionists have the good response. No, it's not. It's functioning exactly how it was intended to function. Right. Um, and it functions as, as a war machine. And I really like what you said about, uh, you know, the difference between philosophical discourse and the difference between philosophy as a life. Like going out, talking to people as things are going on, yeah. changes your view of the world. So in, in the last decade, you know, I, I was uh, deeply harassed and threatened at the very first Tea Party rally back in 2010. The super right wing stuff was also at the Charlottesville rally, like right where, uh, right beside where where Heather Hare was murdered by the, the racist terrorist. And just that amount of violence forced me to confront the the role that whiteness played in my life in a way that had I not physically been there, had I seen it on TV or something, wouldn't have happened. And likewise, had I not physically been on the front lines of things during the uprising and seen the way that both as a reporter and as a white person, the police were treating me differently than treating other people, I wouldn't have, have changed this fundamental view from, oh, police are an agency whose purpose is to protect us. Um, then police are an agency whose purpose is to protect property and whiteness and to control the population. And right. I think, yeah, it, go ahead. It, it, it struck me as you were, um, it's, I know there's a slight delay, so I'll pause a little bit. It struck me in your talk, you had this interesting formulation uh, about uh, in which you compare the logic of policing and the logic of whiteness and how they essentially you know, are the same or, or, or they're kind of a parallel logic that operates together. And, and that that sort of spun for me this notion of when you say that it's amazing how they were able to get away with it for so long because everyone believes the police, but no one believed, you know, the folks who um, who were voiceless, right? Who Who could not speak for themselves. And if they did, no one would believe them. And, and, and there's a, there's an amazing essay my students are reading now by Robert Gooding, Goodings Williams, in which he compares the 1793 uh, fugitive slave law with the, the Florida uh, stand your ground law. And what makes what made that 1793 law uh, so powerful, and, and you see it reduplicated all over the place, and you just mentioned it, is that always it was the slave ca catcher's word that was taken over 
the slave. It was it was always the judge's word or the master's word that was taken. Even if the slave escaped into it was in a free territory, it didn't matter. That ultimately judicial value was given to the voice of of the slave catcher over the over the, the uh, runaway slave. Much in the same way that it's always the police. I mean, I don't want to overstate the analogy, but but you you see a kind of structure operating there where it's the police. You you without question, there's no question. They they are always their value given to their voice to what they say is more significant judicial in terms of the justice system than the than the person that they might be carrying out an act of injustice. And it's extraordinary to me. And for me, as I was thinking about it, one of the things that sh that that I was considering was that it has to do with a, a, a kind of weird nomenclature that's occurred from from what you know we grew up in the age of the war on drugs and police and there was a kind of policing as an assault like these guys were going into neighborhoods and they were literally assaulting uh, black folks um, yeah. in these neighborhoods. And now we're in the age of the opio opioid epidemic, where there's a there's a po there's a policing of care, right? There, there's there's a, there's a there's a there's a, at least an awareness that that these people who are suffering from um, addiction, uh, there's a vulnerability there, there's a fragility there, and and so that their their voices are are more often heard than the voices that were heard who were suffering the same addiction that was suffering the same trials and tribulations those other voices in the world just were not heard as a matter of fact i actually went back and i tried to find you know documentaries and news reports on you know uh the uh, giving voice to to the difficulties of those folks and that's you it, it, i'm hard pressed to find them instead it's uh, every day we get stories about drug opi the opioid explosion in rural areas and in suburban areas which not surprisingly most of these areas are white um and so what i the thing that pops into my head is that the folks there is an awareness there is not the same license there isn't the privilege given to the vulnerability of a black body as there is given to or even the assumption of the vulnerability of a black body as opposed to a white body, which means that that there's also a decided lack of humanness that is ascribed to a black body as opposed to a white body. So one of the most poignant things in your book, when he describes these folks, I got a monster, right? He describes it. It's, it's, it's not like they're human, right? It's not like they're vulnerable. It's not like as you give the backstory to a lot of these folks, you know, they're uh, they're struggling with their own situation and their own predicament. But that that's irrelevant because at the end of the day, there isn't the same significance given to them. There isn't the same assumption of humanity and humanness as it is to, you know, uh, the 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 housewife suffering in suburbia or the farmer as you described it, uh, when the, the scandal finally breaks the people that are put on the stand as you write are all from the suburbs and from rural america and they're all white because those are the only voices that matter right and that's how these guys as you brilliantly point on your lecture that's how they got away so long got away uh, for so long that there's, there's just a basic level of understanding that you know, uh, th this is a scourge that is affecting drugs is a scourge and violence is a, a scourge that is affecting everyone. But this distinction is drawn about who gets to be vulnerable, who gets to be fragile, and therefore who gets to speak, you know, and their voices acknowledge, man. That's, 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 that's the tragedy, I think, for me. And, and so I wonder if you can you know, maybe speak about that a little bit, because one of the things that occurs throughout the course of your book and in the end, you start to see the breakdown of these cops themselves. Husserl, Herschel is extraordinary. I mean, he he basically just dissolves by the end, man. You know, 
uh, Gondo, they all just kind of fracture and, and, and start falling to pieces little by little. Uh, is it Raham or Rahim? Rayam. Rayam. Rayam, you know, it, it's like he's carrying a cross on his back and he, and he feels compelled to speak the truth. And it's still not clear to me why, but it's just like this guilt of awareness. And for the first time, these guys who have been walking around like they're Superman confront the kind of vulnerability that they de- that they denied these these folks that they were basically torturing and stealing and robbing. Yeah, I mean, all of those are such good points. And it brings me to something I really, uh, I think it's always important to talk about with this. I mean, first, the, the value, you know, we're talking, going back to the last question for one second about the, the way that we see policing and stuff. We assume the other false assumption we make is that police see this as this value thing rather than it's just that's their gang or whatever. And, and you know, as the economy was gutted here for working class people, there were two options. You, you go uh, on one side of the drug war or the other. That was the economy. And, and D. Watkins wrote a, a great story that, that I was the editor on for Huffington Post uh, over the summer paralleling his life uh, as a drug dealer in Herschel's life as a drug cop during, uh, during the last decades. And it, it's just a beautiful, brilliantly written story. Um, and so someone like Gondo, who, who was black, grew up in Northeast Baltimore, um, and someone like Jenkins, whose fam- many of his family are drug users, they found it better and more lucrative and safer to join the cop side of the drug war, but they didn't really have any value, like, oh, I'm doing the right thing. So they started, uh, you know, Gondo used it to help his friends who were drug dealers. And that's what brought them down. And that's the important thing uh, I want to bring out about what you were just saying is, there's a version to tell the story, which has been told in, in The Sun and elsewhere, that um, this cop, Gondo, a black Baltimore cop, was working with black Baltimore drug dealers who were selling narcotics to white people in Hartford County, and a white sheriff's deputy rode in on a white fucking horse and arrested them all and uh, cleaned up the day. And that's just a wrong version of the story, even though it, it, there's something that's right about it. So. They would have entirely overlooked the Gun Trace Task Force. The, the, when the Department of Justice was here doing its Civil Rights Division, doing its report on the city police department, their office was directly next to the Gun Trace Task Force office. And it, in fact, helped give cover to uh, the, the bail bondsman drug dealer, would pretend to be a DOJ guy when he went into police headquarters. And it gave him even freer access. And they stole from evidence control, pretending to be DOJ. So it, they didn't, it, this all went under the nose of that investigation. Um, but what happened is there was this county uh, deputy in both Baltimore County and Hartford County, these deputies who were trying to trace back overdoses to Baltimore, to the people who were dealing the dope, to the almost all white people who were OD. And that came became of interest to the U.S. Attorney's Office because there was a U.S. Attorney who many people cast as the hero in this story. Um, for prosecuting these cops. He was looking to get uh, murder charges for overdoses. So if you sell someone dope and they OD, they can be charged with murder, uh, which, you know, I think is atrocious. Um, They were tracking that down. They find this one, they get a wire on this one drug dealer and realize he's talking to this cop, Gondo. They get a wire on Gondo. A new Sergeant Jenkins, the mastermind here, takes over, and then they get all of these. I mean, what the thing about the GTTF, the reason we called them the America's most corrupt police squad is because it was like a super group of grimy cops. You know, they were like all cruddy in different ways, doing different things, and then they were all together right before body camera and stuff came in. And so they went on this, they were going to go on this big spree. Um, but the, the feds never would have caught on to this at all. And internal affairs certainly wouldn't. And the Baltimore Police Department certainly wouldn't if they hadn't been doing the same kind of racist policing that they had been doing. They were desperate to prosecute black people for selling dope to white people. And um, so, you know, the trial, you're right. And I want to clarify that the, the trial of that crew, um, which was known as, which they called as the Shropshire Organization, Shropshire and and uh, also Kyle Wells, who were Gonda's lifelong friends, 
I, I communicated with them a lot from, from in prison and their trial was one after another, after another, after another, after another, and after another of white drug users testifying. And it really was this thing of, of sympathy and pity. And nevertheless, every text message that was put into evidence was, thank you so much for meeting me. I'm sick, whatever, you know, I need to get right. Uh, people were grateful. And so they denied that there were a conspiracy, that there were, you know, the, those charges, but they acknowledged that they, they all acknowledged, yeah, we were selling dope, but uh, we weren't this conspiracy and we weren't doing that. So Shropshire gets 25 years, partly the federal sentencing guidelines. He'd had previous arrests, almost all of which were from Gun Trace Task Force people, uh, mm. but those counted as points against him. So he gets the same amount of time as the worst of the, the uh, Gun Trace Task Force cops with Wayne Jenkins of 25 years. Jenkins uh, caused a car crash that killed someone, planted an ounce of heroin on someone, and the guy spent seven years, eight years in jail uh, on those fa fabricated charges. He broke into people's houses regularly, imprisoned all, falsely imprisoned all kinds of other people, gets the same sentence, and Jenkins is white, by the way, gets the same sentence that Shropshire gets for giving, selling dope voluntarily to people, wasn't even attached to any of those ODs. Was because of the conspiracy, they were then able to tie him to the ODs as well. Uh, the same thing with Wells, he got 18 years, and Herschel and the other cop who didn't plead guilty got 18 years. Um, so the the injustice, people sometimes think, oh, this shows we're cleaning up, things are gonna be, it's gonna, it's changing policing. That's just wrong. It, it was the racist nature of policing that accidentally brought these guys down. And it, the racist federal sentencing and federal guidelines and stuff um, are the reason why the, uh, the people who were selling drugs have the same penalties as these cops who sold also far more drugs than them. It, it said, there's, a, there's a question uh, that someone put up which sort of relates to something I was going to ask, which is about the, uh, the statistics and, and just the blindness that, that sort of provided a cover uh, uh, that blinded uh, or uh, willfully blinded uh, the higher ups in, in the police force and also in the mayor's office. Um, and, for, and, and so I'm going to ask this question, but before I ask the question as it's written, because it's kind of a long question, but, but I'll go ahead and read it. But I also wonder, and I wonder if you can think, if, if you thought about this, this uh, if this focus on statistics sort of reflects a, 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 a slight change and how policing has moved from sort of an instrument of discipline, of discipline, of sort of a disciplinary um, apparatus into a kind of control mechanism, right? It's it's not about disciplining people, right? Discipline people, you you discipline people for what they do, whereas where I'm thinking like a control, a mechanism of control is you you, you judge people or arrest people for who they are. Um, and so there's, it, it, and I wonder if statistics and uh, play into that. So the question that is asked by uh, 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 one of our participants, what role does crime data play in the politics of policing and would analysis of the data to understand multiple variables, variables contribute to racism, contributing to racism be a better way to reimagine policing? And these multiple questions. So that's the first question. And for example, the Center for Policing Equity advocates for da data analysis rather than data gathering. Instead of looking at the number of part one crimes, we should analyze them in the context of multiple variables, such as education, attainment, housing, availability, et cetera. What are your thoughts on this? Yeah, I think that that's a great question that, that ties with, with your question as well. I, I think it does work together nicely because statistics often uh, make us think we're, you know, it's an epistemological question. They make us think we're knowing things when, when often it's also blinding us. It's the same thing about questions opening the world. What questions we ask of the data um, reveals a certain, certain things about the world and, and the questions we ask to gather data. Um, you know, our city leadership is almost always blinded by the big statistic, the murder. The end of the year, the top line murders, what mayors rise and fall on, police commissioners rise and fall on, and it's vitally important. I mean, the number of people who are killed is just, uh, you know, it's tragic here, but we use it then as an excuse for every policing abuse and as an excuse to not do anything else. 
How can that city council person want to wage minimum wage when we have a murder rate? And we use it as a bludgeon to smash everyone else down. Uh, so I think that, yeah, we need to look at And then crime data is specifically uh, very, very flawed and faulty often. Um, the way that, that the crimes that are reported, uh, so not, not necessarily the arrest, you know, cops getting rewarded for their statistics too are one right. of the main ways that Jenkins got away with it is, oh, you getting the numbers because then the right. mayor can bring those numbers to City Hall and say, look, and the mayor can bring them to us and say, look, we're winning this war on crime. There may have been 10 murders in the last week, but we're doing something. Look at these guns we got. Um, what what we're missing on that in looking at the crime statistics is they'll they'll inflate and in order to justify being in an area they'll say oh we have a big crime spike here I, I wrote a story about it a few years ago on juvenile crime we need to get more people out for this juvenile thing and almost all of the juvenile crimes supposedly after zero tolerance is gone that they were coming to was fourth degree burglary fourth degree burglary is just sitting on a stoop yeah. But they're able to report it as, well, there's this rash in burglaries. Um, and there's no burglaries at all. It's kids hanging out on the stoop in the summer. And we're able to use that. And again, we're not asking the right questions. And so I yeah. do think that, that the kind of things, uh, if I understand the questions, right, the kind of context um, of these multiple variables, education, entertainment, housing availability, not only should crime data should be looked at in terms of those, but those should really be seen as much greater crimes than, I mean, what is the greater crime? The slumlord who has the vacant, that someone's being charged with, with fourth degree burglary for sitting on the stoop, right. uh, or the uh, the kid sitting on the stoop. And so I, I do think that that's, uh, the, and then we see the way that the establishment will look at them differently. So to come back to this first question about defunding as well, um, when you have half a billion dollars, $500 million every year going to police and you're having 300 plus murders, it's clearly not working. Yeah. And we can take that money to other places, safe streets. We did a lot of uh, work this summer on safe streets for the website, The Intercept. And safe streets is a violence interruption program. Uh, it's modeled on, on a program called Cure Violence that takes, it, it's perfect for this moment because it takes a, public health look at violence and it looks at it in the same way we're looking at COVID and stuff now in terms of contact tracing in terms of how the violence spreads so when there is a homicide they know that there's retaliations from that homicide safe streets are all uh, ex-offenders who have who are, are called credible messengers they have uh, trust on the streets and they don't talk to police at all so people yeah. know they can trust them to help mediate these beefs, stop the beefs from coming. Um, they, it, they, give, they give voice, right? They, they're, the, they're the link, right? The yeah, voice. or they just, they go to someone and say, hey, listen, don't just chill for a minute. Like, don't yeah. go retaliate. They know the person who's most likely, you know, they contact trace. They know the person most likely to get revenge for the shooting that just happened. And they aren't a voice. They're precisely the opposite. They have a code of silence because they're oh, okay. just trying to stop the violence, not bring the violence out. But it can be, you know, one of the cases I was talking to him about, someone was, uh, someone snitched on someone else in 2004. They were both locked up. Uh, but this was the background then of a 2015 shooting because one of the guys got out and the other guy's brother went to go shoot him. And so like when we're looking at crime data, how do you account for that? Right. And how do you account for the uh, numbers of crimes that murders and stuff that something like safe streets will stop? And how do you account for the number of crimes that someone like Wayne Jenkins of the Gun Trace Task Force causes? So when you pull up on 50 people a night as they testified to and steal drugs from them, every one of those persons now has a jam and has to go back to someone else and be like, I don't have the money, I don't have the dope, no, they didn't give me any paperwork, no, they didn't. And then that causes spirals that create violence as well. And so the statistics uh, really lead us in wrong directions and make it hard to see. Uh, they, they intentionally cloud over alternatives to policing. 
And so if we say streets has such a small budget and Hogan, uh, who, by the way, in my news brief here is chief of staff was just indicted, uh, you know, but, uh, you know, and, and corruption is a kind of violence also and corruption Absolutely. is contagious and spreads in that same way. We, we see that here the way that so Rayum, uh, who David mentioned earlier, he was a, a B&E guy. He would break in. He would, one time he was sleeping with a woman who uh, also hung out with drug dealers. She would go out with them and leave the window open. And then he would go and break into their houses and steal stuff. He dressed as mailmen to break into people's houses. He did. But when he started working with Wayne Jenkins, Jenkins' bail bonds guy wouldn't sell heroin, would only sell coke because uh, he had a daughter who was a user. Jenkins wanted someone to sell coke. He gets Ram to start trying to sell his dope for him. Ram gets a Philadelphia cop to do it. So you see the way the violence as corruption spreads. That's what Safe Streets and other programs like that are intended to solve. But all of the money goes into the police uh, budget and it sucks it from our budget everywhere else. That 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 is what makes um, that episode in which you have Davis, right? After these guys have been busted, right? And then Davis basically stands up, you know, uh, and, and and says, well, you know, the you know, the a few bad apples speech, right? Which is the typical thing. You know, these guys don't represent the, the department and blah, 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 blah. And of course that ignores exactly what you what you're pointing at, which is that it's a systemic problem and that and that the the few bad apples thing makes absolutely no sense if you have now a Philadelphia cop involved in this wrapped up in this whole uh, all this corruption in Baltimore and you can see that just structurally it is so corrupt that even the the good cops and you I, I forgot the name of the young guy um, Stopless. right right Stopless, right who who they kind of test right to see if he will go along and join their corruption and he does the right thing right and and the first thing they do is they transfer him out so they get these the good get compartmentalized and the other good that are there sort of negotiate around it but don't actually deal with the structural corruption that's present in the police force which I want to raise a question that that because um, I, I, I know we're we're moving towards the end here, and I'm, one of the unintentionally hilarious things about this book was uh, the camera situation. It is it's extraordinary how you <laughs> how you point to this. Now my naive my na naivete, which I'm sure uh, I sell, I share with others, is that you know the body cam thing is an important stopgap. And that it gives us a way to, you know, make sure that these we can have some oversight of these cops, right? But we've seen, obviously, with Breonna Taylor, we've seen, obviously, with George, we've seen with all of these cops that that is not the case. But you actually detail the kind of performativity that goes on with these cops, where they'll they'll actually like directors in a film, they'll they'll shoot scenes from so that it, it covers whatever um, crime they're committing. They'll stop the camera and then they'll go, well, stand here, say this, do this, and they'll shoot it. And then that'll be evidence used to get, it wouldn't even matter what anyone saw, but they now they have this camera evidence. And I had no idea. I'd never thought about it being so easy to manipulate cameras in this way. And that in fact, it, it, it becomes just one more element for uh, police corruption and to widen the, the sort of injustices are, that are being carried. That's part of what I mean about talking about this bad apple thing. There's an example of a structural problem that we thought may have been resolved, right? But in fact, a, a, good, a good criminal is going to find a way to manipulate things. And these cops, these criminals, cops, criminals, however you want to describe them, they most certainly did that. And I'm wondering um, if you could, you know, maybe talk about that a little bit. And also, what's the status of uh, City Watch and, and the uh, cameras on the police and BPD at this point? Sure, yeah, they, they, you know, we definitely, police people always forget the other half of the bad apples thing, which just spoils the whole barrel. Um, right. 
Right, exactly. You know, and, and one of the, there was a cop, uh, Joe Crystal, a few years back, who told on his sergeant and was run out of town by other police. He would not get back up when he called. They would put rats under his windshield. So it really is like straight up gang uh, type of stuff. And, you know, Wayne Jenkins especially was, is a particularly bad cop. Uh, he was, he really was kind of a criminal mastermind. He was also a particularly good cop. The same things that made him a criminal mastermind made him uh, successful as a police officer. But we did want this to be that this is an outgrowth of policing. It's an outgrowth of what we expect police to do, of the freedoms we afford them, of the secrecy we afford them. This is what happens from especially plainclothes, warlike policing. Um, and so, yeah, they the body cams did have a little bit of effect, as well as City Watch and the other cameras. You know, we have, uh, as they started coming in and getting more and more Jenkins, he got called in 2008. They went to a bar and locked a bunch of people in a bar and searched them. That guy had a security camera. That caught Jenkins on there. They sued him. He lost the suit, but they only got awarded a dollar. They planted drugs on a guy in 2014 wrote it up differently. That was caught on the on the, the City Watch camera. That kind of got him in trouble, but he got out of that. Um, so then they learned that they could use cameras. This is before the body cameras when they had their cell phones. I just got a, body, a cell phone bit from them where they broke a guy's jaw and he's sitting there shivering. And they told him, well, you can go. He, he's suing now. They told him, we're going to let you go if you say, basically, and they ask him, okay, you were running on your own volition, right? Yes. You tripped, right? Yes, you feel your only reason you're hurt is because you're you're shaking because you're cold, right? And he, they would tell him what to say. Um, they would have fake questions to ask people to justify the reason they went into a house. They went up to a woman next door to where they wanted to get in and pretended they had chased someone. Went up to her door and asked if she ran, saw someone run out, and if they knew someone there. So they would have evidence of this chase, which never happened. So yeah, this was right around the time when we're like, body cameras are going to save us. 99% uh, of the time, body cameras are just another tool of the surveillance state that yeah. are used against uh, citizens and defendants. Not only are they done at police discretion, they turn them on later than they should and all of that sort of stuff, uh, but they are from literally the police's perspective. They are, uh, it is like a... What do you call it? A first player video game yeah. uh, where you are operating. You see his arms and stuff move out in the same way you would when you're playing a video game. You are invited by the very format to identify with the officer and not to identify what you see. And then when they release it, they uh, they release it selectively only when they want to release it. They release it. Uh, they circle what they want you to see and they can edit it. Uh, the, the, it's owned by the same people that make Taser. Axon, and they have this evidence.com web website that lets them actually do a significant number of editing, amount of editing on it. So it really is not, um, if anyone ever gets charged with anything, uh, have your lawyer ask for the entire, uh, make sure they get the entire footage and the unedited footage and discovery. Um, because you they do, yeah, go ahead. Know, one thing, it goes back to what you were suggesting as you started out, because the thing that, that I find uh, disturbing about them is that it, it stops us from asking not only the right questions, but any questions, right? We assume, again, it's like you said, it's one more instrument from the police's perspective, which is to say it's the police's word. And so we, it, it, it almost acts as a way as just a, a, a cutting off and, and questions do not go beyond that point with few exceptions. And, and even when those questions are asked, they almost always are framed, first of all, as a way to support the perspective of the video, which is why it's often so difficult that you can have a cop on camera that's misusing their position. And even with that, right, even with that, that, that it's still difficult to, to, to bring justice uh, against a, a police uh, injustice. And so that's the thing that, that's interesting to me. What I wasn't aware of or that I hadn't thought about is it's so easy to manipulate. And so what are we, what are we left with at this point, you know? I mean, and that really is the, the thing where I'm glad to see so many people raising questions about ways that we can do things other than through policing, ways that we can 
break out of this model that is, has really sort of crippled our cities um, with abolish, you know, abolition movements and stuff. Because even, you know, in this case, uh, or any time when there are, are killer cops, you know, the chance like can't stop, won't stop till killer cops are in cell blocks, that's still just supporting the carceral state. We're still just wanting more people in jail. We're still wanting U.S. attorneys to come and prosecute. We're still wanting, and so like, you know, and I I was for a brief period at the beginning of this case, we were kind of sucked into that, like, wow, these, these U.S. attorneys were really doing the sort of right thing here and prosecuting these guys. Then you see, well, they were actually trying to get uh, murder charges for someone selling uh, heroin to people, and they, those people got the same sentence, and so you're like, we have to think of something different than just more incarceration, uh, okay. even when it's it's for bad cops. And how do we do that? And I understand the the right now the system we have justice is hey look you murdered someone you need to be held accountable in the same way someone else would. But ultimately that continues the same logic of yeah. policing and won't fix our our larger problem of uh, what we do in order to I mean. The charges against the officers in the Freddie Gray case emboldened these officers and are part of what pushed these officers to do what they were, were uh, and made the state's attorney's office less likely to look at them because they wanted to now be nice with the police. And so, so it's so complicated. Uh, I'm, I'm really happy to see how many really smart people are thinking through a lot of these problems. Now, we didn't do it in, uh, you know, as a solutions type book. But I, I do think there are more solutions uh, being being proposed out there in, in really impressive ways. And I'm glad to see the conversation has turned to defunding police rather than what we need to do is give them more surveillance. That's right. going to be the thing that's going to work. I mean, one last thing on that. You know, people probably know we also have a spy plane that flies over. Right. City surveilling us all, almost all the time, but at a pixelated level where they can't tell you know your your body but they can see you uh the the logic is if they see a shooting they can then match that with city watch as you're going somewhere else but that caught a police shooting uh back in 2016 it showed that what the police said wasn't what had happened uh that guy was still nevertheless was was found guilty and and uh locked up and those two cops have now subsequently been charged as two related to this case who brought a, a BB gun when Jenkins ran someone over. Mm. Uh, other cops brought a BB gun to throw under the car so they could pretend the guy was pointing a gun at them. Uh, these two guys were involved in that, and they didn't use that to uh, hold these guys accountable at all. They only, um, they only used it. They've actually solved nothing with it. It's just a pure technocratic libertarian uh billionaires dream and of surveilling <laughs> Baltimoreans. But, uh, you know, the, the surveillance rarely works to our benefit. Yeah. And well, you know, just to try to tie this thing all up as we move towards the end here, you know, you started out with asking questions and and bringing up this issue of the invisibility thing. And, you know, and you said, you know, you wrote the book not to provide. It's not a policy treatise. You're not there to sort of necessarily provide answers, but you sure clarify what the issues are and, and, and what the questions and the conditions upon which we should be asking these new questions, the questions that haven't been asked before. And I think ultimately at the end of the day, once again, to, to sort of bring this back, this is where philosophy and journalism meet. Um, philosophy is not criminal justice, it's not sociology, it's not psychology. Neither is journalism or investigative journalism, but but there is a commonality in which we meet, and it's asking those questions. And one of those questions uh, is, and 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 one that we confront uh, every single day, and that we've been confronting pretty much for most of this year, is how exactly we deal with the present we find ourselves in. Who are we at present? What is this? You know, as a black man confronting this every single day, as a white man confronting this every single day. This is the this is the conversation we got to have. These are the conversations, the questions we have to have is the basis for that conversation. So, I, you know, I really want to thank you for giving us the opportunity to to have this conversation. 
And I want to thank you for asking those questions and putting it in this book and presenting it today. I think it's been uh, uh, fantastic. Is there anything you want to end with? Anything you want to say? Yeah, somebody asked, uh, you know, speaking of where we are now, someone asked where they could buy the book. Uh, okay. I'd be remiss not to say that, but it, and mainly because uh, it's so important that we support our local bookstores, you know. Uh, yes. it's They have it. It's everywhere. It's at Amazon or whatever. But like uh, the day the book came out, Jeff Bezos made $13 billion. And like <laughs> our local bookstores are really struggling. So there's Urban Reads, there's Greedy Reads, there's Atomic Books, uh, yeah. there's Red Emma's, of course, which is is... And, and if you you can also, if you want to do it online, there's bookshop.org. Yep. You can decide which local bookstore you want your money to go to, and it will do it through there. But uh, please do get it from a local bookstore because they we we need to buy our actions in this time uh, with our money and our, our voices and our actions, create the world we want to be there when we get out of this weird pandemic situation. And we need those bookstores to be there. Um, so Urban Reads is a black-owned bookstore. Yep. Uh, Red Emma's is, is a worker-owned cooperative yep. bookstore. So support these bookstores that support us. The, you know, they're there for us all the time, and they, they put their whole livelihoods in, into making, you know, we couldn't write books and stuff if it weren't for people like them. So I just I urge everyone to please, please support your, your local bookstores. Absolutely. I got mine from Greedy Reads. So uh, yes, please, that's, that's a perfect way to end this again, Baynard, thank you so much for this. I really appreciate it. Um, my students appreciate it. Uh, the community appreciates it. Um, and hopefully we can we can get you back and we can have this conversation again. Thank you again. Yeah, I'll have to come back when it's real life. Uh, much love <laughs> and grim solidarity to everybody. Thanks, y'all. All right, thank you.